good to be with you once again as we study First Peter. I hope that you're doing well. Um, I hope that you are feeling the Lord's presence in your life uh, during this very strange time. I mean, there's so many fears around us. We begin to wonder whether we're ever going to get back to normal. And yet, um, you got to view it as this is, this is what the Lord is asking us to endure right now. And he's going to work through it. He really is. He always has. And, and he always um, finds ways of extending blessings to us, even in um, extremely unusual times like this. We're being, <clears throat> all of us are being asked to sacrifice in one way or another. And um, I think that in and of itself we're, we're, uh, is, is a blessing, actually. Um, we, we certainly want things to get back to normal. We, um, we have concerns about our life, our economy, um, uh, and we want it to just be better. We want things to be back to back uh, the way they were. Um, and there's nothing, there's nothing wrong for, uh, about that. Nothing, nothing wrong with praying for that. Um, but as we pray for that, let's, let's pray for um, backs that are strong enough to bear up under this adversity. But, and also eyes that are open to the many, many blessings that are ours, um, even in a time like this, maybe especially because of a time like this. Now, in uh, Peter wants to talk to us today about that as well, <clears throat> because he's gotten into a section of his letter where he very much is focusing on how um, we have victory in the midst of suffering because that's how Jesus did it. Jesus' pathway to victory, the, the, the pathway to the triumphant resurrection from the dead, his ascension into heaven, his city, uh, sitting at God's right hand, the pathway to that victory was through suffering and death. And so when Christians go through pathways of suffering, when we are in the valley of the shadow of death, we have victory because we have a Savior who's been victorious before us. And he begins today by um, writing one of the clearest redemption passages in the Bible. I mean, you, you want to talk about um, clearly being able to share with your neighbor what Jesus has done for you and for them. Just take a look at 1 Peter 3, 18. And I'm only going to read um, the first half verse. 1 Peter 3, 18. Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. Wouldn't that be a great passage to memorize and to just have in your back pocket to share with people? Like, um, what's your what's your deal as a Christian? Like, what is it? What what do you say Jesus did? Why should I care about Jesus? Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. Now just think about what he says there. Christ died for sins once for all. The Greek expression that he uses for sins is actually a technical term that was used of the sin offering in the Old Testament. So, so Christ's payment on the cross or Christ's death on the cross was a sacrifice that removed sin. Christ died for sins 
and he's got to do it over and over again, right? No, once for all. One-time payment. Remember what he said? It is finished. Okay, this is done. This bill has been paid. This mission has been accomplished. It is finished. Once for all. The righteous for the unrighteous. Literally in the Greek, the righteous one in the place of unrighteous ones. So, in the place of. Not only, uh, it, and it's, it's helpful, friends, I think if we think of Christ's sacrifice on the cross in, the, in that term, in the place of, substituting for. Is it true that Jesus did that for our benefit? Yeah, you better believe he did it for our benefit. But he also did it in our place. So all of that wrath of God that was rightly going to fall on us because of our sins fell on Jesus in our place. He absorbed the wrath of God. He absorbed the punishment of sin. He stood in the breach. He took it for us. He's our great substitute. So if you ever hear the expression, the vicarious atonement of Jesus Christ, that's what it's talking about. Vicarious means substitutionary. So he was in our place. To bring you to God, that's his last phrase in uh, 1 Peter 3, 18, to bring you to God. How is it that uh, sinful people can stand in the presence of the holy God? This is the only way, if Jesus brings them. And the only way Jesus is going to bring you into the presence of the holy God is by removing your sins first. So he does that on the cross and then he takes you by the hand and he brings you into the very throne room of God Almighty who does not punish you, but he hugs you. He loves you. He wants you. All possible because of Jesus Christ. A victory like that needs uh, calls for a parade. You know, when a local professional sports team uh, wins some kind of championship, there's going to be parades. I can remember, I'm old enough to remember uh, 1982, and uh, the Milwaukee Brewers lost the World Series. But we were so excited that they were even in the World Series that we threw a parade for them after they came back from losing it. So there are parades associated with successful human organizations. There was also a parade associated with Christ's victory over death. And here it is. I'm, I'm continuing on now in 1 Peter 3.18. He was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit, through whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison. Have you ever wondered about that little expression in the Apostles' Creed, he descended into hell? And so when we confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed, we say that. After he was buried, we say he descended into hell. And I think it's, it's easy for us to think, well, that was part of the downtime for Jesus, sort of that part of his humiliation. You know, he, he suffered under Pontius Pilate. He was crucified. He, was, he died. He was buried. Oh, and he descended into hell. Actually, this passage, and then there's one other passage, Colossians 2.15, which teaches us that the descent into hell was not part of his downward um, humiliation, but it's part of his upward exaltation. Why? Because 
it was a victory parade. It was Jesus announcing his victory. Um, it says here that he preached to the spirits in prison. I don't know if preached is the best translation there. It's much more like announced. He announced that he had been victorious over the grave. So this happened sometime before his physical resurrection from the dead, which, or I should say, um, before people actually saw him outside the tomb. Um, not a lot in the Bible about the descent into hell. Um, and so we shouldn't really <clears throat> make too many claims about it, but it is clear it was part of his victory. Not He didn't go to hell. He didn't descend into hell in order to uh, suffer. Finally, he suffered hell on the cross, didn't he? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? To, to suffer the forsakenness of God, that's suffering hell. So he did that. So he didn't descend into hell in order to suffer hell. He didn't descend into hell in order to bust out any um, like Old Testament believers who were being held in some kind of a holding cell, uh, like uh, the limbo. No, that's not what the Bible says. Nor does the Bible say that he went there to give the condemned a second chance. No, it's, it says that he descended into hell to proclaim his victory. And so I suppose you could say the first Easter sermon was heard by the devil and his followers. And the preacher was our Lord Jesus. It was a victory parade. Peter now goes on in verse 20 to give an example of who those uh, spirits in prison might be. So who those, um, the, who the condemned would be. And he says this, people who disobeyed long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it, only a few people, eight and all, were saved through water. So Peter focuses, for some reason, um, he focuses on Genesis chapter 6 and the days leading up to the flood. Now, those, there were a lot of days that led up to the flood. It would appear from uh, Genesis chapter 6 that um, God decided in his heart that this was going to be um, the articulation of his wrath upon sin, a worldwide flood. He decided that like 120 years before it happened. And in those 120 years, um, anybody who would have been listening to Noah who in 2 Peter chapter 2 is called a preacher of righteousness. So if, if you had been listening to Noah, or if you just had watched him as he's building the ark, if, if that were the case, um, you would have repented. But they didn't. Sadly, they didn't. And in the final analysis, only eight people boarded the ark, Noah and his wife, their sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and their wives. So that's eight people in all for whom the water of the flood was their salvation. It actually lifted up the ark and lifted them up above the destruction. So that's the picture Peter wants you to have about the flood. He, he wants you to see the water of that flood of actually being rescue for eight people who believed in the one true God. And now he says this. 
this water of the flood symbolizes baptism that now saves you also, not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. Baptism is like the water of the flood. Now, in what way is baptism like the water of the flood? Peter says it flat out. It saves you. Baptism now saves you. So just like the water of that flood lifted people up above the destruction, so baptism is one of God's ways to lift you up above the destruction, to bring you to himself to bring you into the family of God. It saves you. Um, I need to just take a minute here to say that not every Christian denomination believes this. Um, not every Christian denomination is going to say, baptism now saves you. And um, they will also say things like, well, baptism is a symbol. And they'll find in this passage the word symbolize. And so, th so they'll say, well, see, that's really what baptism is. It's kind of a, it's a symbol of what, for Christians, like what Christians are doing for God. It symbolizes my dedication to the Lord. Well, if you read this passage carefully, baptism isn't a symbol at all. The water of the, of the flood is, bapt, is a, a symbol. And what the water of the flood makes us think of is baptism, which actually saves you. And Peter wasn't the only one who said it. Paul said it too. He called baptism in Titus chapter 3, um, uh, something that saves you by the washing of regeneration and renewal. So he used the word save as well. So for, for anybody who is offended by this idea that baptism saves us, first of all, that's what the Bible says. Secondly, of course, salvation cannot happen except through faith in Jesus Christ. So, baptism is one of the means that God uses to actually work faith in the human heart. That's how it saves us. This is how God chooses to use it. And um, that faith that it works in the heart, Peter says, is a, the pledge of a good conscience toward God. The Greek word for pledge is a legal claim. So the picture is this. When you have trust in your heart, trust in Jesus as your savior from sin, which is actually worked or implanted in there by baptism, when you've got that, You've got a legal claim on God as your Savior. I'm going to hold you to your promises, God. Your promise is that you will forgive me of my sins through faith in Jesus Christ. I'm going to hold you to that. And you see, that's, that's how we have Christ's victory. Even in our rough times. We can hold God to his promise that he will raise us up above the destruction and hold us close to himself and finally bring us to him in heaven 
where he sits at God's right hand, Peter says. So Peter has taken us through all of this, what we call the steps of Christ's exaltation in this one passage. Think of the Apostles' Creed. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, where he sits at the right hand of God. And from there he will come to judge the living and the dead. All of that is in this passage. We have a victorious king for our Savior. And his victory is our victory. And I think what's so important, and this is what I'm trying to take away from this word of God for myself today. The pathway to victory for Jesus was through suffering. Why would it be any different for us? Not that our suffering somehow like earns a victory, but rather that's just the that that is the God ordained way that even in suffering we will have victory and it's not defeat it is not defeat when we go through challenges it's not defeat when we fall down it it's not defeat when we have doubts it's not defeat when we have fear it's part of our pathway to victory. We will have trouble in this world, but our Lord Jesus has overcome the world. He gives us the victory. Let's pray about that. Today, Lord Jesus, we honor you and we praise you as our victorious King our exalted head. You live and you reign for our good. We can't thank you enough for that. And we are asking for a special measure of your strength and your confidence as we are asked to walk through times of suffering. Help us to encourage one another and help us to focus the eyes of our faith on you. Just as you went through suffering, so we are asked to suffer. Just as you won the victory, so we have received the victory. Help us to live in that truth today, Lord Jesus. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. God bless you, everybody. I'll see you again tomorrow.